few small things about myself. I've been coaching for about 40 years, too long. Basically, it's all N's and B's. You will see them here. I've been a national champion for the shot put and the discus um, eight or nine times. I'm national throws coach of Barbados. I work at the National Sports Council. I've been here 35 years plus, I think 36. My club, BC Track Athletic Club, I'm the founder, the head coach, the manager, the bottle washer, everything of the BC Track Athletic Club. I attended BCC, the Barbados Community College. I did the associate degree in physical education. And then I attended BCC in Florida, Daytona Beach, which would be Bethune Cookman College. And my major was physical education with a minor in psychology. I'm a member of the Barbados Badminton Association, sat on the executive, played badminton, and the Barbados Darts Association. And the recording secretary was the manager of the Barbados team to the America's Cup when they were held in Barbados in 2016. Uh, good. Okay, so we on to developing youth throwers for track and field. Throwing is one of the basic human movements. We have run, jump, throw. Those are the three major things that you use for all sports, all other things that you do as well at some point in time. The Olympic Games, the events that were held at the original Olympic Games were the disc and the spear. The spear was a actual spear that had a strap attached to it that it was slung and the disc of course, was something a little larger than the standard discus that we have now. And that was thrown, I believe, anyhow. But I said people used to run across and throw it, spin around and throw it, jump up and throw it, all kinds of things. In the modern games, we have the shot, the discus, the javelin, and the hammer. And the hammer would be a metal ball, a shot foot, basically, with a wire and a handle attached to it. The Youth events in this region, we use, do the tennis ball, knapsack, we do the cricket ball as well in most countries in the Caribbean. And baseball is thrown in the Central America and in North America region, Puerto Rico, at the NACAT Juniors, which is a youth meet. They throw baseball instead of cricket ball. For training the throws, for complete, completing an event, whatever, the equipment you would need some balls, usually, um, I think they're Fox balls, the cricket coaches will correct me. Some cones are some flags for markers and about 50 meters of linear space. You need 50 meters in any direction for the good ones, the really good ones, which are usually the bigger boys and the cricketers. The runway and the javelin, for the javelin is usually used for the cricket ball. It is what we are seeing here, basically a run up, a, a two lines at the sides that you can't step on. The line at the front is the one that is supposed to stop you from going over. These are the sector markers here where the ball is supposed to land. The distance for the runway is between 30 and 35 meters. And the width is about four to 4.3 meters, I believe. The sector is, I, it escapes me what the arc for the sector is, but it's, it's usually measured straight across. I think at the top is about five, the, first, the closest thing is about five meters across. And then it widens gradually as it goes out further and further. The safety, we look at a little safety here for the cricket ball, the tennis ball, baseball, anything you do that requires something to be pass, passed from the hand into the ear or whatever, we have to make sure that the area is clear. There are no glass bottle, et cetera, out there for the kids to stand on or for the ball to hit a bounce up, et cetera. We position the children to stand. Usually you put them to stand behind, anywhere behind the scratch line and usually about four or five feet away from the side lines. So nobody stands below the line of the scratch line. And of course you try to encourage them to carry the balls back, not to throw them, not to toss them in the air because there's always the danger of them falling and hitting 
one of them in the face or in the top of their heads. The rules for throwing a cricket ball, basically cricket ball, tennis ball. The ball usually is thrown over the shoulder. It has to land in the sector that we just looked at. It lands between these two lines in order to be measured. If you run up and release the ball and it goes back behind you, it is a foul. If it goes out to the sides, it is a foul. And obviously outside the sector lines as well. And basically, are, of course, and you step on, if you step on the scratch line before, after you release the ball, well, before or after you release the ball, you step on the scratch line is a foul. When you release the ball, you have to go back and go to either side in order to have it measured. We look at a little periodization. Everybody knows about this. You divide the year going backwards from what have you considered to be the major meet. So if you are looking at the CUT for the athletes, you start there and you work your way back to September or whenever you want to start your training. If you decide you're going to use a five month span, a three week span, a two day span, whatever, you work your way back from the first major, from the last major meet. And then you go back to the, the you start the training where you want it. You have to factor in the usual specific, um, general specific pre preparation, the competitive phase, and look at the transitions as well. For some people, there will only be one transition, which will be after, maybe after knapsack. If you have the kids that do really well at that, then you go further down into the year. You might have to have a mini transition there around Easter and then go on to the second um, competitive phase where they'll be training and competing for the CUT then being the last meet. Um, volume, we look at the amount of, the amount of work that you give the children, the amount of training that you can put on them, and then the intensity that you use as well, which would be more, would more relate to the quality of the work that they're doing. Because if it's, if it's um, high quality work, there will be less. If it is endurance work, um, higher volume, the quantities will be more. Like I said, we will look at the competitions. You determine the competitions for the youth age group, eight to, uh, eight to 15. Usually we look at anything from four to maybe eight competitions in one year, spread out over uh, maybe a, um, a six month or seven month span. The transitions I mentioned before, where you get the recovery from the major competitions. So after CUT, you might take a little week off or so, let them do a little swimming, a little relaxing, not too much eating. And then you start by the training and build up towards the next meet that is on the calendar for them all the way to the CUT. We know about including the, look at, looking at the amount of time you have, you include the macro cycles, which are the larger plans, anything from three weeks to three months. And then the microcycles, obviously the units, the single units, a one week plan, four days, three days, depending on the amount of um, time you have for the training. Talent selection, we ain't gonna just look around and say, okay, I use a big fella, come here. You're gonna trigger it. We're not doing that. We're gonna test for development. We're gonna look at the kids, the big ones, the small ones, the ones that play cricket, the ones that stand up in the corner and try to hide. And we do maybe a little a basic testing for them. Some of them, you can just give them a ball and tell them throw it. And then you will look at the fella and say, well, you can't throw the ball, you move from there. But if we go into something a little more technical, a little deeper, we look into determine the individual strengths and weaknesses of the athletes. We are looking to establish levels of fitness, see where they are at, at a specific point see their specific abilities. If they can run, they can jump, they can throw, they can only hop on one foot, they can stand up on the head, whatever. And then the testing is incremental. If you do the first test, you go back six weeks or so later, you do another test that will show you the progress that has been made at each stage of the testing. And obviously you will discover some abilities that you didn't see before. You might find a fellow that might be a jumper or you might discover a thrower that you didn't know before. 
Uh, feel free to ask any questions if there's anything anybody wants to know. What happened? Okay, so we're working on basic fitness test here. The template looks a little long, but if we look at the first couple of components, 40 meters, we're testing for speed, pure speed. Standing broad jump, you're testing for leg strength, jumping ability. You want leg hop, you do three hops on one leg, you measure the distance, you come back, you do three hops on the other leg. That is for our coordination and jumping ability as well. The overhead medicine ball, you're looking for strength. Then we have the other stuff that you can go, the endurance run then would be the other one for that short, uh, for the short fitness test. This should be the really basic one. We have the core strength you can test for, sit-ups. We have the push-ups to test for arm strength. The sit and reach for flexibility. You sit down, you put your foot on a box, you stick a ruler on the top of it, you reach as far over as you can and hold it. And then you come back a few weeks later and you test the same thing again. If they've been doing the coordination and the flexibility work, the strength work, whatever, their reach will increase. Um, I think Shepard had a question. Yeah. I, can't, I can't see that. Right, Mr. Shepard, I know you have, you have No, a I was asking if you, if you wanted us to ask the question as we go ahead or if to wait until a specific time because I, I didn't want that. I had a question and you go too far ahead and you know you got an old cycle back. So I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't sure how to go over the questions. Okay, I had said that we could, if you have a question on any specific area that we are touching on, ask the question at that time. Oh, and sure. then at the end, if anybody wants to come and ask something, we can always, we can always have questions at the end as well. All right, I have two questions then. So let me just ask them quickly. Uh, if you can answer them concisely in this time, fine. If not, you know, I guess we can do it. So I, I remember you showed a periodization table um, a few slides back, right? Um, what I wanted to ask, yes, this one. This looks like a periodization table for a club. So for me as a PE teacher, is there an adapted periodization table that I can use for the school year? Because our, our, our year would obviously not be the same as, an, uh, as a normal annual year. Yes, and then you take this and you write at the top, Welch's Primary School, mm -hmm. and usually there are one or two things missing over here. Um, you would have a thing that says uh, months. So mm -hmm. it would tell you the month spaces will be blank. Mm -hmm. Like these same spaces that we have here, one mm -hmm. of these um, rows would say a month. So mm -hmm. you would decide if I'm going to start in October. Mm -hmm. You put October here, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, as far down as you want to go. Mm -hmm. Then, this knapsack is generally in what, March? March or February, so March. Right. So, so if then you're going to start in September when school starts. Right. And then we'll go all the way to March. This first column here on the preparatory uh -huh. would be September, October, November, roughly December. Halfway right. to December or so. Okay. And then the competitive, you just move, you just move it according to where you want it. You will put what you want in the sections. Okay. You okay. Can, you can prepare one of these on a on a table and mm -hmm. just put the months how you want them, where you want them. Then the competitive, you might be in December. Um, some of the kids come to the toilet meet. You, you, that would be the early competitive, pre-competitive. So that would be December there mm -hmm. would be. And then you have a, one of the same columns again, one of the same rows again going across that would tell you competitions. I was trying to find a little more detailed one, but I, I didn't get it. It says oh, okay. competitions. So then underneath that same column that you have for months or whatever, you will go down and you will mm -hmm. put in here in December, toilet. In January, open meet. Mm -hmm. um, end of January or the beginning of February, house sports. The, the, first, um, the first meet, I have the zone. You will go and look for the date and put zone. That then will come as competitive. So in the column, in the row that says competitions, that is what you would put in there. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Then the last thing you will have at the end of the competitive phase would be NAPSAT finals. Unless right. you've got a, a couple of them children down there hiding that are going to do, make the CUT team. If it's a CUT okay. year. <laughs> okay, no problem. All okay. right, so the next question that I had, right? Um, 
when you went forward a bit, you were talking about the um, the, pre the preparatory phase, mm -hmm. and you were talking about the diets of the competitors. You said they eat less food. Um, so my question was, um, do you think that during the training phase that they should have lower calorie diets and during the competitive phase we should focus on the higher calorie diet for those, those children? Good Lord. <laughs> you might need to consult a nutritionist if, if you want to get really deep into that because what's going to happen is a lot of the time the kids just eat what they're given. You recommend, you can recommend things for them, you know, if you're going to train, you need to increase your calorie intake, you need to think upon the carbohydrates more if you're competing, if you're training, cut back on the sugars, etc. You can recommend those things for them. But I yeah. ask that question, right, because for me personally, I, I advise, well, the parents that actually come and ask me a question, mm -hmm. I usually advise them to have a slightly higher calorie diet during their training period, yeah. and then more moderate during competitive um okay. my rationale is that i need them to have the most energy during the training period because okay. that generally is the harder period for me when it comes to a competitor because you're going to be giving 100 percent at your training all the time often right and during the competitive phase as a shorter period of time that you have to give what you're given in training plus more so for me the calorie need should be a little less um, during the training period, the, the competitive um, stage, as opposed mm -hmm. to the training stage. So I just wanted to get your opinion on that before I, you know, I, I allow you to go too far ahead. And I agree yeah. to some extent, but I usually consult nutritionists when I have when I when I deal with the athletes with with the when it comes to the the food and the intake, the amount of things that they're taking. Because depending on the event, too, if you have a 600, 800 runner. They might need to load a little more carbohydrates the day before the zone because they're going to be running something longer. Right, right, right. So the chores and the chores, the, the sprinters will need as much carbohydrates. They can probably just do work with the regular nutrients and the protein, etc. Right, that's it if depends on the event as well. Um, themselves, if you have macro micro macro managing. Um, Sprinters versus tours versus long distance runners. Runners, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Covered. I yeah. I think so. <laughs> all right. So all right. So we can finish off the talent selection. If we want to get really deep into testing, then we can do the sit and reach, the push ups, etc. And the other things are. The weight and the height, those are things that you can measure periodically to see if the athlete is gaining, if they're losing weight rapidly, whatever the case may be. Then you might be able to gauge if they're doing too much or if they're not doing enough in terms of the nutrition or the work. And the conditions are, if you're testing your first test and the rain is falling, when you put rainy and then when you review the test, you would know that the 40 meters might not be as fast because it was wet and it, the grass was slippery, as opposed to the second day when it's Sunday hot and out there, the rail dry, and you had a good piece of dirt, and the fell around the 40 in about tree flat. So the conditions then will help you assess how the, um, the test was conducted as well. And tester is just the name of the person that did the test. Any, any um, queries on, on this? Anybody thinks there's anything that we're missing out? Anything that we should take out? Any ideas? Moving on. All right, we're looking at the training now. The fitness requirements for different events are different. So usually there is, you use the same components, but in different measures. So we train in strength, we got to look at body weight exercises, we do medicine ball drills, speed, sprints, short sprints, because they're going to be running up to throw. Most of them, when they get into the rhythm and stuff, they can need it. We work on the coordination with the player metrics, the, the jumping, the hopping, the uh, ladders, etc. cetera. Uh, endurance, we, we build the endurance by doing intervals, run, walk, maybe between 600 meters and 1,000 meters. And on that note, the, for the fitness test, 
the endurance run here would be anything from 600, say I'm 600 to 1,000 meters. You don't really need anything longer than that. 1,000 meters is basically one lap around the stadium on the outside. And then according to the, the size of the athlete and the its weight, and if you have any medical conditions, you might want to give it a shorter, shorter distance run than the others. That might be, might be a lot fitter. So a fellow that has got asthma and can't walk up the steps to get up on the second floor. So you can't send him to run a thousand meters unless they tell you to walk some. So you might put him to run the 600. And then the second time you will test him over the same distance. And obviously, if we are gonna build a total athlete, we work on a combination of run jump throw and that would cover our wrong development of the athlete, not just the throwing aspect. You can just give them a ball and send them to throw. All right, still on the training emphasis. If we're looking at the preparatory phase, can't do that. We have speed, endurance, strength, technique, and coordination. Anybody would like to take a guess which might be the more important one here? Open to answers. Strength. Okay. Mr. Maskell, how are you? I'm All right, well. So we have one answer, strength. Anybody else has anything else? I think that anything else would be important in this section. Speed. Yeah, okay. We work in one to five. One is the most important, five is the least important. Mr. Master thinks that strength is the most important, so that is one. The suggestion for speed, you think that is the second one or the third one, or which one you think that would be in this phase? The second one. Speed would be the second one. Anybody else has anything? Okay. Oh, walks in here. Oh, coordination. Coordination. Okay. As as number three or number two are. Miss Barrow. Yes. Ralph Watson. Yes, Mr. Watson. I'm not a thrower. I've tried throwing, um, but I wasn't very successful at it because I didn't have a good technique. Okay. So I think technique is most important. You maybe went to the wrong school. No, I went to the best school. Okay, so you think that technique is the most important in the preparatory phase? Yep. Okay, so I got three. I, I had no technique. Two. I got four answers there. If we are looking at the preparatory phase, we are getting the athlete ready. We are working on getting them able to throw far, but we need to give them something to work with. You have to build a foundation, okay? So strength, Mr. Maskell suggested as number one. I am with you to some extent. Um, speed, I beg to differ. Technique, Mr. Watson, would actually be number five because you're working on preparation. And if you're in the general phase, we're looking at getting the legs strong, getting the endurance, uh, working on cardiovascular, working on coordination, getting them to be able to hop, to run and stop, to run and throw, to run and turn, those kind of things. So for me, I would use strength as number one, endurance, coordination at between two and three. And the endurance might not be cardiovascular endurance only, it's also muscular endurance we're looking at. And then speed as number four, and the technique will be number five because that's the last thing we're gonna to get to when we have already built the foundation, then we're gonna put some skill on top of it. So when we move over to the specific phase, we might still be looking at strength as number one. We might go up to coordination and speed as two and three, and technique then will come in here. Those three coordination, speed, and technique will come in between two, three, and four. And the endurance would obviously would then would drop down because we would have already built some endurance. Okay. 
then we get yeah. to the competitive phase. The, see, the more, the further across we go, the positions of the things will change. Competitive now, we are into more technique, strength, maintenance, coordination, speed, and then the endurance is still at the bottom. That's when across the competitive phase. Far, right? If we get, when we get to transition. James has a question. Sorry, Mr. Shepherd. Um, the quick question I had to ask, we're talking about an athlete here that is now learning how to, um, to do the technical part of whatever uh, sport it is. Yes, that please. Really? Yes, please. Because I heard Mr. Watson say something earlier that I, um, that I found interesting because he was talking about the, te the technique being the most important. Mm -hmm. So um, I know in other sports, um, football, for example, we're usually um, taught that the technical aspect is taught before the tactical. So then the technical in the youth development stage, the speed, endurance, strength, and coordination is based around technical skills so that the, the athlete is well-versed in the technical skills and then the other skills like the strength, the same endurance, the speed, and the coordination are built around the technical to you know, to create that player to being a, a good player to hand off to an older division age group. So I was wondering what your thoughts might have been on that. I'm not sure if that's what um, Ralph would potentially Mr. Mr. Watson's sport is a team sport. Most well, yeah, team really. sports are based on that concept. Uh, so individual sports. For everything else. Track and mm -hmm. field, on the other hand, mm -hmm. you have to have a base. The same base that all the other sports need to have as well, but it's mm -hmm. neglected in some respects, which is why a lot of the Barbados teams have very good footballers, very good cricketers, very good everything. And then when they get to crunch time, you find that they're falling away because they mm -hmm. can't keep up. We play three quarters in that ball, and then the fourth quarter, we got to give somebody oxygen. So mm -hmm. we build a base, and the base for track and field are these three strength coordination and endurance. Okay. So on top of those then, you put mm -hmm. speed and technique. If you've got a sprinter, mm -hmm. the endurance you are building for a sprinter would not be the same as you build for a distance runner, 5,000 runner, 3,000 runner, whatever the case maybe. Their endurance then would more be speed endurance. So they'd be running like the longest distance they would probably run is a 600 or something like that. Uh, so the a real distance runner now like Mr. Garrens will run probably five miles to warm up. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So the preparatory track for um, preparatory track for track and field athletes is basically upside down from what it is for um, yeah, teams. Some of the some of the team sports. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Important. Thank so, you. So we build the base first, and by the time we get to the com early competitive phase, sorry. By the time we get to the early competitive phase, we would have some strength. We would have some endurance muscular endurance as well as strength endurance, as um, cardiovascular endurance and speed endurance. And then on top of that, then we will put some speed on it, which means the distances that you're working with are gonna be short to those 40 meters and thing that you mentioned before, you'll be doing a lot of those. The endurance component then might only go to maybe you run two laps to warm up before you do whatever it is you're doing. The strength would be maintaining the body weight exercises, the medicine ball drills, the bands, whatever we're gonna do. And we will start then building the technique. So you're gonna teach them the ball throw on top of what they have got on the coordination work, the plyometric work where they're gonna do the hurdle hopping and stuff then. That is gonna come in handy when we get to run, land and throw. The transition, now everything would practically be reversed. We'd be doing no technique in transition because you don't need to practice cricket ball to rest. You're resting, so you don't practice cricket ball. We maintain the strength by doing the little body weight exercises, et cetera, but you reduce the intensity of them, the volume. The endurance would only be maybe get up and jog two laps around the field near to you or whatever the case may be. And then the speed work would be minimal because you're not you're not doing you know you're not doing that you need to to use the speed and you maintain the coordination by doing the 
some of the same hopping and the skipping and whatever else you do. So the, in, in the transition phase, endurance, coordination, strength will be the top three. And the speed and technique will drop back down again to the bottom. But it is only for short time because the transition may be a week, two weeks maximum. And then you go back into the, into the, um, the, the training for, for, for the second part of the season. So you will be basically back at specific preparatory. You won't go right back to general prep. You'll be at specific prep. So you'll be, main, you'll be doing the stuff you were doing in there to work your way back towards the competitive phase again. Are we clear? Any questions? Moving on. All right, so we have gotten all these things in place. Fella fit, he got all the strength working and everything. And we're gonna start teaching the progressions for the ball throw. The first thing obviously is the grip. For any throwing event, pole vaulting, you need to have a grip that is efficient, is technically correct, it works for you. Uh, the grip for the ball, we try not to get it down in here. You don't want to be throwing a ball from inside of here. It is very difficult. Place it in the hand. Fingers are wrapped around the ball. We're not bowling. We ain't trying to be too technical with the seam and things like that. You just grip the ball. That's the grip. We have the cricket ball. Usually, the boys tend to hold it. Um, some hold it across from the seam, some hold it on the seam to throw it. And the third one we have spoken about was the baseball. The baseball has a very unique seam that runs around the ball in a three quarter circle or whatever you want to call it. I find a lot of the kids tend to put their fingers on the, the, the stitching for to get a, a grip on it. For the position of the body, for the throw, we have here record holder from St. Philip, now at Princess Margaret. Look at the position of the arm, elbows bent 90 degree angle. So the first thing we're gonna do, well, the first thing we would do is a frontal, which would be in the lower part of what we talked about, what we're looking at back there. You stand up and just throw the ball for the position of the body for actual throw, the angle of the elbow, you have to bend the elbow in order to straighten it. You can start, you start with it straight. You may start with it straight. You have to bend it and then straighten it to throw. And the balanced arm would be the opposite arm. If you're right-handed, it would be your left arm. It's usually pointed in the direction of the throw and the body is usually sideways on to the direction of the throw. Are we clear? No objections. All right, so we just talked about the body position with the elbow and the balance arm, the direction of the throw. To start up, if you got kids that are maybe five, five, six, we're working on it to start with a tennis ball. You give them the drills you're gonna work with them are things like throwing at a target on the fence or on the wall. You put it higher than their, um, than their eyesight to get them to focus on throwing up in the air. But you also want them to try to throw in a straight line. So that's what the target is for. They don't have to hit it every time, just get close. And then that would help with the angle of release as well. Ideal angle for cricket ball is about 42 degrees, 45 degrees in the air from the, from the um, center of the body. The goal bars for the bigger ones, you stand a little ways from the goal bars five or six feet, maybe 10 feet from the goal bar, and you throw so that the ball goes up and over, up and out. You try not to throw, you're, you're, you're focusing on not getting it in the net or in the back of the goal bar. You're trying to get it to go over the goal bar. So that's the height you're working with, which will give you close to the ideal angle as well. The front, as I mentioned before, you stand facing the direction of the throw. Your feet are parallel, slightly apart. They are pointing towards where you want the ball to go. 
Your chest is pointing in that direction as well. You can put up the arm for balance. You carry back the hand that you're gonna throw away and you stand and throw. You don't turn the body, you don't move in any direction. You're just focusing on using, getting the arm to come over the shoulder and throw. Your body will move slightly, but you don't, you try and you know, don't move the feet. That's why it's called a frontal, you're facing the front. Then we move to the standing throws. Mr. Griffo would be, that'd be the standing throw position. We have one foot in front, the opposite foot. If you're left-handed, the right foot will be at the front. If you're right-handed, we have the left foot at the front. So the left foot is forward, the left arm is out, and the ball is in the right hand. Put the weight on the back leg. You have the back leg bent slightly. The back leg is usually placed at a right angle to the direction of the throw. So the, the, the left foot will, will be pointing into the sector, and the right foot will be pointing over there by the discus throw or something like that, over by the 300, something like that. And you put the weight on the back leg, you lean into it, and you transfer the weight to the front. So when the weight comes to the front, then it goes on the leg that is the, 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 the left leg, that would be the left leg, and you bring through, bring through the right arm, bending the left arm, you bend the left arm, pull it to the outside of the body, and throw. There we go. 48, 68, I think that is. Elbows bent, the, the, the opposite arm is coming in, is coming down. The guy next to him, don't look at, don't look at the, the ball hand, look at the other hand. See where his elbow is bent, pulled, he's pulled down. He's putting the weight on the front leg, transfer the weight from the back leg, nice position with the back leg, by the way. And he puts the weight on the front leg then to bring the ball through. The young lady at the top, I think that is Westbury, I may be wrong. Um, you can't see it very well, but her elbow is bent in a strange position, but she's going to bring her hand over her shoulder to throw the ball. She has turned her body, but not her hip, because look at her foot. You will see that the toes are still pointing somewhere over to the other side. So she's turning the body, but she has the hip locked. So that she will get difficulty then in bringing the ball all the way, the body all the way around. Okay. And the number two person, um, Sharon maybe, has already released the ball. The weight is on the front leg, all the way on the front leg. She's lifted the back leg to regain, to maintain her balance, to regain her balance, whatever the case may be. And I am hoping now that she will put this foot on the ground and hop off of that foot so that she stays behind the line. Okay, you can see her elbow is bent, her left elbow is back, ball is gone, right arm is coming down. Any questions? Okay, so we are at the shuffle or the crossover. Now we have mastered the standing throws. They can stand up, turn their body, throw the ball and, regain, re and maintain their balance. So we're gonna move over to onto the shuffle now. These are the ones that have developed some good coordination and stuff, and they can walk and talk at the same time. So we go to the shuffle, which is at basically a side on position, and you 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 do karaoke. You can do no, sorry, the karaoke is the crossovers. You shuffle by moving the outside leg in front of you all the time. So if you're right-handed, you're gonna have your left side facing the direction of the throw. And when you move, your left foot will move first all the time and the right foot will follow it. So you're shuffling across in a straight line. Then you get to the front and you, you turn your body and throw. You have progressed to the crossovers now. So we're gonna take one step, jump, land, throw. You start with the left foot back. If you're right-handed, you start with the left foot back. You take one step with the left foot and you do the jump that we usually uh, call the net ball landing. Up in the air, you come down and you go one, two. That will put you in a position where the left leg is in front of you. The weight would then go from the right leg, which you landed on, which you've also landed on, 
on the right leg to the left leg, and you, you throw the ball. You increase it to three steps, you carry it to five steps. But as many have mastered the, 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 the smaller ones then, and they grasp the concept of run, jump, land, throw, you will go to the, to the longer runs. Mr. Topping, where do I find my video? So, so you have to stop sharing. Let them let you want to show a video. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move to we're gonna look at the, the, the one, two, three step and the run up with the crossover, which is what these last two are. And we're gonna do it via video. Okay, so just hang on a sec. Stop sharing the screen for a second. You get it? Yeah. So share screen. Yeah. Okay. You can press screen. And then we go back to your home. I could just keep talking, right? Okay, so here we are. Javelin thrower. It is in slow motion. Don't look at the javelin. We got a cricket ball thrower running in. So he's, he's running, he's gonna take some steps. Arm goes back, the cricket ball has gone back. See the, ball, the front arm, the arm at the front now. This is the balance arm. He's in the, the final phase, crossover, jump, land, transfer the weight, pull the cricket ball. And then what not to do? Do not go over the line. Good. Here we go again. I'm trying to figure out how to pause this. Pause it again. So where did we have those? So there we are. He is stretch. He's changed the position of his body. Now he's going to sideways on position. The balance arm comes up, the, 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 the throwing arm goes back. And we're into the crossovers now. This is the cro real crossover, karaoke. Because. Oh, that's a lovely position. Really beautiful. All right, so we have Mr. Kevon. He's into the crossover. Leg comes out, the leg crosses in front, not behind, in front of the, other, the opposite leg. Has a really good position there for the shoulders. Nice, nice linear movement. Okay, good balance. Hips are back to the position straight. There we are. Weight on the back leg. He's about to transfer the weight to the front leg. And just pretend that the javelin is a cricket ball all the time. I didn't get that one stopped. There we go. All right, it was a little early on the um, on the transfer of the back leg. He didn't hold didn't hold the block long enough. The block would have. I don't know how to do this here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the foot. His, his hip is open a little too wide. He would have had to keep keep that foot closed a little bit more, a little longer to get for the power position, to maintain the power position. Oh, wrong thing. There we go. All right. And then he would have, if he had stayed behind the line, it would have been a legal throw. Stop. We'll go back to. So stop share. Stop share. Mm -hmm. Then go to share screen again. Share screen. And click on PNA was on. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. There we go. All right. So we've covered basically the progression progression for teaching the throw. And we for throw for, for track and field, mostly basically you work from the front back from the end back to the beginning. So that's why we start with the frontals. You do the last thing first. So you learn, you learn how to release the ball, 
then you learn how to throw it. Then you, you go to how to throw it and you throw it in the, in the standing position. You go to the to the crossovers, the shuffle, the crossovers, whichever, the, which, whichever one they can use. And then we go to the run, crossover, throw. Any questions? Yes, Wendy. Um, yes, please. For the power position, is it recommended to have a brace front leg, like a straight leg? Right. That's why I was um, pointing out that the young man had moved his foot too far over, so his hip was open. So when you plant at the front, you try to keep your foot straight in the direction of the throw or slightly into the body, which would be something like this slightly, which will, which will hold, hold the power position longer. You delay the movement of the other hip coming through then so that you get the maximum amount of momentum, velocity, everything else for the throw. So his was a little, a little off in terms of the, um, the plant. It was, it was, his hip was open because his foot was open. All right, thanks. All right, we're good there, people. Uh, what do you say, move? Okay. All right, that's my boy. And there we go. All right. So in conclusion, this is part one, by the way. So in conclusion, we have learned how to throw the ball now. This might be two, two sessions, three sessions later when we get to the actual full throw. Because, I mean, you can teach it all in one session if you have the time, depending on the amount of time that you have with the athletes. You have an hour and a half session, you can teach the full progression for the throw. If you have a lot of kids, you might want to teach the standing throw, do the frontals and, and the standing throw in one session, and then come back a, a week or so from then and do start, and then go to the other, progress to the other one, to the crossovers, the, the, et cetera. So we have a we would have a little wrap up activity at the end of end of that first session. Um, the target practice one, now they would have had some practice with that. So we might say, okay, you give them five tennis balls, see how many you can hit the target with, how many you can get to go higher in the target, whatever the case may be. We don't want anything dropping below the line of the target, okay? You can put a cone in the middle of the sector for the bigger ones, uh, maybe 15 meters, 20 meters, depending on the age group. And how many, see how far you can get past that or if you can get to that or whatever the case may be. And then for the, a little further down, maybe for the, for the more um, accomplished ones, we can have a little throw off. Maybe if you've got 20 children, you might have like four groups of five or something like that, do a little throw off. And then the winners of each, from each group will have a, a champion's throw. So you will have for that session, you might have a, a boy's champion and a girl's champion or whatever the case may be. And they will be the people, the next session now, those will be the ones to beat. They'll be the defending champion for that. I want to encourage you, see the throws as a means of garnering points at NAPSAC as well. A lot of times it seems to be, just put a fell in there because he's play cricket or whatever the case may be. So if you want to gain points, you're working towards gaining points, you need to train the athletes for the throws. So he might be a cricketer or he might not be a cricketer, might be a fat girl or a fat boy or may not be, might be the boniest child in the school with really good technique or good arm strength or whatever the case may be. That is the person that they might, they might be the 100 meter runner, they might be the sprinter. But if they're the best cricket ball throw you have, that is guaranteed 10 points and you sure about the zone record or whatever the case may be, train that person for the event. So you give them the work, they might be able, they can do it with the, along with the other things, the sprint work and stuff. Because a, a throwing session does not need to extend into a full hour and a half of throwing. You can do something, come and do 10 tosses with a medicine ball, 10 over the shoulder, whatever the case may be. Do a couple of flakes, then you do 20 throws and go long home. That's a full session right there. So we're going to try to look at training them for the, for the event in order to garner the points. Because there are two tennis balls and six cricket balls. And now we have two shots. So we're looking at training people 
to get points in those areas as well as the 60 meter and the 100 and the 800 and the medley and those other events. So that by the time you get to the medley, you might have, to, if a fella drop the baton, you won't cry because you lost by the eight points that you would have won in the shot put. All right, do we have any questions? Oh, that means that y'all learn everything that you needed to know today. Uh, not a question, a, a comment really. Yes, sir. This is Rhea Fear from Lawrence here. Yeah, how are you doing? Uh, comment, maybe you could um, comment on it as well. I find that um, in the primary school, especially, um, some parents, um, some teachers too, who maybe not be in PE, don't tend to see the value of the of the throws or see them as as good events. Everybody wants to sprint, and I'm wondering how we can like convince people that throwing is important and that you can get points and it is a gold medal in a throw is just as good as a gold medal in in the in, in meter and meters. The same amount of points. We went to Carifta one year in Jamaica. I think it was Jamaica. Somewhere I took a team. We took I think there were 23 athletes, something like that. They were taking a rough day. We got two sprint medals. Oh, Daily Thompson won the one and the two. I think it was it. We got a relay of bronze medal, I think it was. We got Nicholas Springer won the high jump. Somebody else got a medal in the long jump, I think. We got about four long jump, four jumps medals in total. Out of four triple jumps, out of eight, no, eight triple jumps, and uh, eight high jump, mm, no, four, four triple jump, four high jump, and four long jumps. I think we got about four medals. The throwers were, there were five throwers, I believe. We had um, two athletes in every sprint, by the way. There were five throwers. A boy from Queen's College got three medals, javelin, shot put, discus, and he wasn't a shot putter. We put him in there to keep somebody else company. A boy from Commonwealth got two medals and couldn't throw a javelin, so we couldn't risk putting him in there. But he got two medals in the shot and the discus. We had a girl, she only did shots, so she got one medal. We had another girl that did discus, and we put her in the shot, and she got two medals. The point is that when we got home, the Barbados team had so many medals that we did not know what to do with them. But only five people was wearing them. So the other 18 or how much ever only has six, about 10 medals between them. And the, the I think it was 50%, six, no, it was more than, I think it was about 50 or 60% of the medals were throws medals only. And we have a, we have a, a, a fairly rich history with throwers. People see the hurdlers, everybody remembers Braffitt and Braffitt, and remember Greg Marstwith, all of them. Dave Taylor, Michelle Garvey, the, the, um, the Patterson boys, all of them were throwers. And when they were going to primary school, they didn't have any primary school sports, so they started their, their, their athletics in secondary school. There were also very large children. I think Davidson weighed about 200 pounds when he was in secondary school in fifth form at LSD. The Patterson boys were all big. So they, they were naturally big, but they were also very good technicians. Had a really good technique. Dave Taylor could stand up and throw 45 meters. I know because I coached him. So those are the people that got the medals. When there was a like a, a whole way slant in terms of the throws, in terms of the sprints, the relays, the hurdles, we weren't getting a lot of medals. The throwers were get were bigger home medals. And medals are points. Sorry, throws are points. They are also medals. So all y'all need to get to work and train two cricket ball throwers in every division, in boys and girls, two tennis ball throwers, and four shot putters. And there we go. Because on the nine is two boys, two girls. On the 11, two boys, two girls. On the 13, that's 12 children. That's 120 points though. 
And then you're on 13 again, two boys, two girls. That's four children. That's 40 points. See, see where you're going with this? Yeah, and, and, the, 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 and the under seven with the tennis ball. And the tennis ball children now is another 40 points there. If, uh, sorry, I come, I come get wrong. 18 <laughs> points. 18 points for two children, not 40. Can I get 40? Can I get 20? 10? 10 for the, for the winner and, ten, and 8 for the second, I believe. Yeah. So you can stand a chance of getting 18 points at every one of those throws. And when you add them up and you get 10 throws, that's 180 points. So how much is winner? Is win, I'm thinking with? How much is winning the zone with? Two something? 300? <laughs> y'all see me? Y'all see where you're going with this? So yeah, yeah, yeah. we need to focus a little bit more. I mean, spread it around. Don't, don't tell yourself now you only need to train throwers. You got to still train the rest, but you got to make sure that the throwers get specific yeah. attention because they're technical. The throwers are the most technical event in track and field. Outside the pole vault, because I will teach nobody pole vault. Pole vault is your foot up in the air, your head down on the ground, you're holding on on a stake. That's the most dangerous event in track and field. Throws are technical. So you got to spend some time with them. If the children get the correct technique, they will throw fire. I want to thank you for your attention. I appreciate that you took the time to come. You, I had a lot of people here. Oh, I appreciate that you, all of you took the time to come and look at me. I hope you have learned something that will be of use to you in the future. And for the second session in the series, we would look at more specific training for the throwers. And then we will look at the shot put technique as well. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Be safe. Thank you too very much. Thank you. Nice right, presentation. Welcome. Thank you. As always, we do want to thank the Smith for our presentation and along with the other three coaches who were presented in this leg of the National Sports Council's continued education program. This completes the second series, and we will have another series on four next term. So on today. This will be posted in the teacher chat. It will also be posted on the National Sports Council's coaches YouTube page. That is NSC Four Skits on YouTube. So you can feel free to go there and do it as well. So until then, stay safe, stay healthy, wear sanitary, wear masks, and so safe as possible. Thank you. Have a great evening. I forgot your last page. Thanks, Ryan. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Annie. Okay. Thank and that would have been the last page there for the presentation. What well, we need to look at when the kids are past the knapsack age and they're going into secondary school, those are the events that we need to sensitize them about, get them to look it up, read upon it, whatever the case may be, see if they find an interest in it. And some of them will go straight into under 15, which means they'll be throwing this. <laughs> Yeah, and, and then, this is a weight. Not this is not a hammer. This is a weight. This is thrown at college and in the U.S. is thrown in the high schools. Um, on the collegiate scene at the national level as well, they throw the weight first and then the hammer. So we, we could start getting them interested in the, in these events when they're moving on from primary school. Um, we have the small, smaller discus. A point seven five that you can start them with for rubber discus that you can start them with the train and then of course we go from the two k to the three k shop as well. Thank you very much. I will see you all again.